Welcome to this next presentation of the UCI's Sustainability Seminar Series. It's a great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Linda Fernandez. She's a, an associate professor of environmental and resource economics at the University of California, Riverside. Her work explores incentives, economic incentives, for pollution control and natural resource management at different levels of social organization. She began her career as a student at, at UC Davis, where she did her bachelor's degree in international agricultural development. She went on to the University of Hawaii, and while a master's student there, she worked at the East West Center's Pacific Islands Development Program, looking at development and water protection projects for small island states. She then spent several years working with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, Region 9, on water quality and agricultural projects involving economic incentives to reduce pesticide and erosion conditions of water. She did a PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, in agricultural and resource economics. Tonight she is going to talk about pollution control across international borders. Please join me in welcoming <coughs> Thank you. I'm happy to be here and participate in this seminar series. And today is actually a perfect day. I'm glad it started raining today because it's a constant reminder of precisely one of the media, mediums we're going to study. We're actually going to be talking a lot about water its flow and what it might carry with it between countries that share borders. In addition, I'm actually going to be um, alluding to some um, air issues too. And so keep that in mind, it's just, you know, as you walk around today, granted the rain was light, but uh, as it rains on us, it's irrespective of any sort of barriers uh, between us or for that matter on a larger scale between countries. And so what I'll be highlighting with a few pointed examples today of my own work research that's actually been used at different scales to inform policymakers and sort of um, have them refine some of their uh, efforts on decision making is really examining when there are these shared pollution problems uh, in many cases, the recognition of some very fundamental differences, both physical and economic differences between countries, should be part of the discussion in pondering solutions. It could influence incentives, how you go about structuring management strategies. And so I'll highlight these with a series of illustrations, uh, discuss some particular transboundary pollution problems in our own backyard and on, on our own continent, uh, so financial sort of transboundary pollution problems. And because I'm an environmental economist, I'm going to convince you, hopefully, it, that um, some economic analyses I've done that combine natural sciences, social sciences concepts, uh, really are quite useful to elucidate some policy and institutional solutions that have gone on, taken place. And because these are, in fact, quantitative, it's involved some effort on my part to actually go collect some data, do some field work. So I'll march through on different scales what that's actually meant, and you'll get a feel for sort of the variety of uh, effort that has to go on in these economic analyses to do it right. Um, I'll be highlighting some results that have actually help to uh, ponder over the long term um, some very serious investments in solving these problems at the financial, financial levels. And then draw some very fundamental conclusions that we can take away and see this as a perspective of very good examples for the rest of the world in what might, in fact, be long-term sustainable solutions for these problems. So through a series of some maps, I'm going to talk through maybe what a lot of you already probably know from perhaps 
travels in some of these areas, but I'll just kind of elucidate some really basic concepts that are important to recognize. So this is, in fact, our continent, North America, and I'm going to highlight a couple of key areas that we're going to be looking at. There's a long border, this is the U.S.-Canada border, and, you know, from this map, its orientation, you might think naturally that uh, that north to south, sort of orientation of Canada up at the top there, the U.S. in the middle, and then here's another international border, U.S.-Mexico border, um, that north to south in general implies the general direction of a lot of pollution problems. And I'll just say I'm going to raise a counter example and show you some proof of where it's important to kind of recognize that these are very long borders. There's often very different sorts of gravitational flows going on, both in terms of water flow, um, air shed flows, that matter in terms of all the countries caring about the pollution problems they share and or what they can do about it in terms of if they're actually endowed with the resources or not. Uh, whether they're upstream or downstream to do anything about these. So let me just point out what these borders look like, and then we're going to take some closer up views. So I don't know if anybody's ever crossed this border at any point along the way here, but let's just notice a couple of things. Uh, here, you've probably heard of these um, big giant pools of water that, in fact, they are the largest conglomeration of fresh water in the world. They constitute about 25 percent of all fresh water in the world, the Great Lakes system. And we can imagine they're shared bathtubs <coughs> between the two countries. Keep that in mind. It's a different sort of perception of shared waterways than a river that might actually flow north-south, or as we're going to actually look at, a river that flows south-north, going out of Mexico into the U.S. Whether you're upstream or downstream should matter. Whether the, the water quantity or quality that one starts with upstream and how it might actually gather momentum, gather pollution along the way and where it ends up downstream can matter in terms of how you're affected by this water flow and then what you might care about trying to uh, change those impacts to you. So, what we're actually going to be spending time with first, because kind of sort of build up the scales of analysis here, we're going to focus uh, our discussion first off in one watershed, and then build up to an entire border's perspective of how some decisions have been made across many watersheds. And then we're actually going to look at the tri-national picture of uh, several airsheds. So keep this in mind that even though, again, north-south, Sort of orientation of things doesn't always imply that uh, the wind blows north south to deposit everything into the U.S. Let's say from Canada or uh, the U.S. into Mexico. It could be that things flow south north to change the perception of who's downstream or down airship of things. Okay, let's look at the southern border and the way in which this drawing is depicted. It's not quite to scale. By the way, this border is uh, about 1,800 miles long. And just to give you an example of how water can flow differently, here's the Colorado River where it was originated in the state of Utah and it's flowing into the Sea of Cortez here in Mexico. It is, in fact, a north-south orientation of gravitational flow. And a lot of depend on it for water supply and or it picks up some pollutants along the way. People care about cleaning it up along the way. So there's been some expenditures there. Another river uh, is, is the Rio Grande, which is in fact, the river itself is the international border. Uh, and it actually is a significant part of the border from the edge of New Mexico, state of Chihuahua, uh, down into Okay, so water flows kind of vary along this border. What well, we're actually going to be, and in some cases, we're out this really interesting river here. 
this is in uh, the southeast part of the state of Arizona into the state of Sonora, Mexico. It actually leaves the U.S., goes down into Mexico, comes back into the U.S. So it's a really interesting management, or, management arrangements there in terms of uh, expenditures of first being upstream, then being downstream in terms of caring about where the water ends up and the quality of it. Okay. Another map I wanted to show you, because this gets into the nature of um, some focal points of these borders of North America and how we are in some ways very parallel to the rest of the world. At one point in history, it was often considered that borders were sort of buffers, barriers to kind of uh, have uh, some sort of protection against your neighboring country. Whereas, in a very real way, this map, and I don't expect you to have to be reading all the type on this map, I'll just say this, um, sorry, it's a, it's a cut and paste job out, on, out, of a, uh, out of a report, and it's basically attempting to illustrate major cities that face each other mm -hmm. along the border, this international border, and in fact, they literally are straddling populations where people are very connected, facing each other in two different countries. I'll give you an example. <laughs> Uh, the, the corner of the state of Texas and uh, Chihuahua, Mexico, El Paso, Texas, Ciudad Juarez, they literally only have to walk about 100 feet over a bridge and the two cities are very connected. In fact, their economies are very connected. And so in some cases, this, this border is rather seamless in terms of uh, people dealing with each other every day. Very real real way, and they in fact care very much about the uh, air they share and the water they share between them. And it's become a focal point of discussion to motivate a lot of that the problems were becoming quite apparent to residents of this border area that something over time needed to be addressed of their um, sort of constant battles with uh, water quality or quality. But keep that in mind, there's about four cities that face each other on this, this is again a 1800 mile border. It's about half the size of the US Canada border. And let's go over some variation in what's happening on the southern border, because one of the watersheds we're going to look at is on the southern border. So basically, um, in a very real way, these cities are have been growing over the past, let's say, 30 years. Uh, they are big, heavy concentrations of um, population in terms of a lot of movement, let's say, from interior Mexico to locate at the border for a lot of labor opportunities. I'm not sure if you've heard the term for a lot of assembly plants located just on the other side of uh, the U.S. in Mexico on this long border. They're called maquiladoras. How many of you? You have heard of that word. Okay. These are assembly plants which basically um, consist of a labor force down in Mexico assembling, oftentimes it's electric, electronics, um, uh, various sorts of industries have located down there, and through some agreements, the um, products are then sent back to the US or into Canada. Um, under some agreed upon arrangements to have uh, labor force down there. What that's meant in terms of these cities are that a lot of people want to go there and, and work, find opportunities that don't exist elsewhere, let's say in Mexico, or for that matter, um, not quite available in the rest of, let's say, the state of Texas, but are closer to the border. So let's just think about this. Okay, there's a lot of people living in this area. The wage rates may be higher than the interior, uh, the cities themselves, um, we could actually go back, well, I'll just note that if we look back on this, this map and I just pointed in general uh, south of the border to say that it's kind of a uh, serious significant distance down to the heart of Mexico, the capital of Mexico, Mexico City, and then it's also quite a significant distance over to our capital, Washington, D.C. And in many cases, the 
orientation of a lot of governments is quite different between the two countries. A lot of financial decisions for management on a very basic level uh, in Mexico are very centralized at Mexico City. So in fact, cities along this border do not have their own separate uh, structure of um, budgeting. And actually, I don't know if a lot of people participate in uh, the election type process here on a general basis, but oftentimes on our um, ballots, there are often some um, efforts, perhaps some preponderance, to vote through bonds to help pay for things at very different scales of government. Governance, let's say, county level bonds or state level bonds to do things. Well, in Mexico, that's not really the case, but they have this ability to raise funds for a lot of public works projects at the city level. So I raise this issue as a means of saying these border cities are quite different in terms of their ability to finance anything that might be going on in the city. And it's, you know, it's just something to note that perhaps the Mexican counterpart, let's say Ciudad Juarez, facing El Paso, might not have the same municipal budget, budgeting abilities to do things, let's say to address some water quality issues. Keep that in mind. And here's something important to note that's going to come up later as we talk through some financing channels, that production at the border, remembering in these assembly plants, it may be the case that the labor forces down in these areas are really producing things, and they might be, you know, um, utilizing some inputs there at the border, but a lot of these products that go elsewhere. So consumption's happening elsewhere for what's being produced right at the border. Now, back in the late 90s, there was this, I don't know if you've ever seen this acronym before, this is an acronym for the US General Accountability Office. It's kind of this investigative arm of US Congress. And their role is really to do sort of this uh, investigation of where public funds might best be directed. That's their role. Back in the late 90s, this comprehensive analysis, they often gather a lot of information from you know, some experts to make some projections on what was necessary on the southern border, the U.S. Mexico border. Here's what they found. And by the way, this is late 90s dollars, so just keep that in mind. That they were projecting that about 180 projects, we'll say, um, the label their projects made in order to do various forms of pollution control, let's say the water pollution issues I was alluding to, um, some air pollution issues that I'll spend some more time describing um, in a bit, uh, they were identifying that about 180 projects in total would really help this region out, the 800 miles, 1800 miles worth of this border with those the 14 cities grouped around each other. And about that much and they were guessing that the way in which these uh, different airships, watersheds are connected, that about, you know, of the 180, 122 need to be in Mexico and 58 in the US. General sort of projection at that time. And keep that in mind, that number 180. We're actually going to walk through some analyses where we're getting now pretty close to meeting that total amount. But I'll tell you something more about that along the way. Okay, let's even take a closer view now of one watershed that we're gonna actually see a lot of my efforts to analyze what, what's happening and then we're gonna move out and scale. What are we looking at here? Well, the Tijuana River uh, watershed and it's a south to north flowing. I'm just pointing at the upstream. This is Tijuana Rolling Tijuana. And I don't know if you can really see this. The resolution of this map is kind of uh, varying. So uh, I'll just point out that this is actually a very uh, steep, kind of with some definite ravines and gulch type settings here, where there's quite a bit of urban development, often unplanned, throughout Tijuana that straddles a lot of different steep gulch 
erodible type areas. There's a particularly important canyon called Dove Canyon that's actually been the basis of a lot of measurement of um, some aspects of connectedness in this watershed. So here we are, this is the upstream part of the Tijuana River. So let's just imagine that the entire drainage, let's say, starts up in the um, upstream part of the watershed. It then is carried over the border, in some cases quite diffusely, out of these canyons into, by the way, this red line is in fact the U.S. Mexico border, into the southernmost part of the continental U.S. And this is the, it's actually designated as the label here. It's a national estuary of significance in our country, according to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in that it's a quite large, wetlands, that supports a lot of habitat, migratory habitat for birds, uh, things like that. And this is the southernmost beach in the continental U.S., Imperial Beach. But this is the ultimate drainage passageway of what flows out of Mexico into the U.S. Now, I'm going to bring up this aspect again of the erodible, steep nature of this so, you know, urban urbanization happening in Mexico. Often times, again, it's been in the mode of this labor moving into the border area for job opportunities, things like that, without a lot of attention, let's say, that Irvine, California place on doing, you know, planned urban growth. It hasn't happened in Tijuana on the scale of Irvine, as you're probably really familiar with li living here, that it's quite manicured and, and managed type urban development. In the case in Tijuana. I'll just summarize a uh, few aspects of this watershed and words that are going to become important for investigating um, the economic analysis. Uh, some ways in which water pollution, and I, I should, sorry, going back to this picture again, I'm going to say that when it rains in these areas, some noticeable types of things that flow with the rainfall are often people's property. This unplanned uh, kind of sprawl, uh, you know, perhaps they're quite basic structures for people to live, um, uh, haphazardly in some cases, um, may in fact just erode down the hillside and be quite you know, dramatic in terms of uh, property loss. And so oftentimes, what is a very real aspect of this sort of, you'd call it stormwater runoff, because it's not often channeled in a, in a proper <coughs> type, type way, might actually be a combination of erodible material, so sediment, sedimentation, uh, the actual you know, aspects of what, what might be, you know, some solid uh, waste, along with some sanitation issues. Some unsewered, you know, wastewater flow comes over the border here, too. Okay, so let's get a picture of um, something of defining this water watershed in terms of hydrology, physical type setting here. So, it's a huge watershed, and three quarters <coughs> of it is considered Mexico residing in Mexico upstream. Downstream, as you saw in that picture, is this wetlands of national significance. And I'm not sure if anybody's heard of this convention. They're celebrating their 40th year this year, the Ramsar Convention, that designates wetlands of international significance. Apparently because this particular setting is quite a flyway for migratory waterfowl. Traveling the Pacific flyway. And we this recognized source of a lot of the concern of this biannual water flow, that this uh, sprawled activity means there's a lot of things coming over the border um, that may mean, you know, gee, this runoff is laden with a lot of things that probably shouldn't be coming across the border. Uh, the erodible sediment, the uh, stormwater, the um, sanitation and sewer, untreated sewage. Okay, and now to get into some aspects of um, how hydrologists see things, we have to imagine that from upstream, there's this way in which you model water flow 
that it's, um, you know, it flows at a rate, let's say it's, you know, um, uh, you know gallons per minute, something I'm measuring like that, and then it accumulates somewhere. And somewhere in the water flow, there may actually be pollutants that might, we might care about in terms of where they settle. And so uh, part of what my job is as an economist is often to talk to these other people, natural scientists, um, other social scientists, and do a very good job of characterizing things like pollution flows, financial flows, management flows. And so I raise these issues because I have to do something about capturing these in my analyses, and I'll show you how I attempt to do that. First off, I'll raise this asymmetry or this difference um, again going on between the countries because it really does matter to motivate incentives or caring on the part of both countries sharing this watershed. So again, uh, I'm an economist, I care about financing issues and costs and benefits, uh, again, in this case, of pollution problems in the shared watershed. And so the ability to finance this cleanup between the upstream country and the downstream country isn't the same, bottom line. And again, even the source of their funds isn't the same. Again, things happening in Mexico City it may not be that Tijuana has their own source of bonds uh, to have people vote, to set aside money, to do things, let's say, like sewer management or proper urban management, things like that. So that's just sort of something to be recognized, you know, formal bond structure. The US more decentralized, the city of San Diego, look at their budget, is quite a bit larger in terms of Tijuana's overall budget that's handed to them for Mexico City. And, in a very basic way, the people who live in these cities, let's call them the users of some of the um, public utilities, uh, if, if in fact they be provided, um, vary in their abilities to pay. And this is just a basic um, variation going on in, let's say, the minimum wage structure. facing each other. Okay, and so, in fact, when I, um, as an economist, am attempting to try and <coughs> model or investigate what's happening in this watershed um, in the past, currently, and on into the future, um, I draw on a series of tools that in many cases means that my job is really to match the um, scale of management with the scale of the pollution problem. Remember, this is a binational pollution problem. It's going to involve binational decision makers. So there's this phrase for the way in which the framework would be a good thing to model more than one decision maker, and that's game theory. Not sure if many people have heard of, of that, but it basically means you're involving a really good De, you know, definition of all the stakeholders involved. If there's more than one stakeholder, a game <laughs> involves um, at least two people, maybe even more than two people or two countries, to try and ponder what are the sort of different options one might have if two people, two countries do things together versus trying to do things separately. It is just, that's what game theory and, and some efforts to model things using game theory and ball. Really basic questions, where to solve the pollution problem? Do you do it upstream, do you do it downstream, do you do it in both places, both countries, in this game sort of setting? And if we recognize already that there's some clear differences between these countries, one country sending pollution to the other, one country more endowed financially, um, how much is in each country involved really? Can we call it equitable just to say let's divide it in half? So really, my efforts are really to, in a quantitative way, explore what it really means for countries to cooperate. And I'll actually give you a slew of different options for what cooperation could actually mean here. 
it's not just one one option. So, but in a phrase, it would actually mean that they're doing things together, versus comparing non-cooperation where they might act alone. Supposing it's the case that in the end the downstream country is strapped with everything. Um, you know, what would that mean in terms of you know an outcome? Would it be completely impossible? And what I'm going to be tasked with then is to do a really good effort, because this is in fact an empirical study, to look at a case where there's entirely different, in a quantitative way, pollution control costs upstream and down, uh, the flow and stock effects for upstream and downstream differ, the ability to pay, and then some measurement of damages. And I'll allude to um, some efforts that actually involve some UC Irvine people and damages uh, that I work with. But the ultimate, you know, the answers that I want to provide uh, help with, you know, sort of responding to these questions. What are the gains to cooperation for instance, with wastewater control across this watershed? And what can induce cooperation when you have such variety, such difference going on between, in this case, the upstream country experiencing different types of costs and damages than, than the downstream? Okay, I'm going to talk through now some definitions that come not from me, but the international setting of governance where some other people have tried to ponder very topics of getting countries to work together. Maybe some of you have heard of these concepts, maybe these are completely new. I'm going to try and just kind of make these definitions simple. You can read up on these later on because they are quite fascinating and have been used in different settings. The Helsinki rule actually comes from a bunch of lawyers who pondered some cooperation issues on varied topics from defense uh, to some labor migration issues, but right now I want to get to the point of how it matters in our context of environmental kinds of issues. And why do I raise these four different definitions uh, across the top here? It really comes down to these are ways in which it might vary how the U.S. and Mexico try to handle things together in the Tijuana watershed. It may be that when they might ponder, okay, you know, this wastewater pollution is coming from Mexico into the U.S., if we try and coordinate things together, how are we actually going to, it says here, sharing the gains? So again, as an economist, what does that really mean to me? It often means if, in fact, pollution is controlled somehow by both countries, what are the damages that they've avoided? It's a combination of doing a, um, an assessment of how U.S. and Mexico divided up those reduced costs and avoided damages together. And all I'm going to go through here is that these four different ways in which they can cooperate can present four different ways in which they finance things quite differently, but are still, in the end, gaining to cooperate versus not cooperate at all. And so, but what I'm really going to be getting at in my own analysis is that by investigating these four different alternatives, it helps in actually seeing how actual arrangements between the countries have played out in terms of some financial channels that they've really utilized to solve these problems at all. And I guess that's the beauty of some of the work that I do is that I actually base it in reality, sort of. I'm not sort of making up something that will probably never happen or never be carried out, but I'm actually trying to actually help, you know, inform policymakers to fine-tune their approach um, and uh, and solve the problems. So here, let's uh, again go through these four different definitions. These international lawyers with the Helsinki Rule, as it translates into the environmental case here is that physical measurements matter for sharing the gain. And so, in a very real way, remember that watershed, three quarters of it is in Mexico. Remember that big drainage area? Okay, so the Helsinki <coughs> rule assigns the shared gains based on measurements like land area. 
hydrologic share literally means water flow space. And another physical measurement is simply population. So keep that in mind. That's how you have the laws and conditions involved in helping craft things some uh, rules of cooperation. The equity rule. You know, what does equity mean? We just simply evenly divide things. Irrespective, let's say, of uh, how different countries actually might be. Now here's where these two definitions actually bring up economics. The Shapley value, named after a man who actually won the Nobel Prize based on this definition, when Shapley, he went, what do you that UCLA? Um, what did he actually win the Nobel Prize for? He came up with a definition that said the marginal contribution that a country makes should be what they actually receive in terms of the net gain. And he did this in sort of financial terms, and it was a theoretical model. So, um, and you can certainly read up on the Nobel Prize. I'm going to actually show you through some calculations what that actually means. If in, in this case it actually means the amount of expenditure that a country might place in terms of financing wastewater <coughs> treatment, that they'd be um, I guess expected to get it, get something out of how much they actually help to reduce the pollution problem overall. Now, this particular definition is not only from economics, but it's actually from an environmental setting. It involved Scandinavian countries dealing with the former, former Soviet Union in terms of acid rain problems. And specifically, why it saved the Chandler Tolkien's two people from Scandinavia, who came up with um, a statement about how it would be useful to account for time and space in solving a problem. And when you're requiring cooperation over time and space between countries, it should be the case that the country could do at least as good as if it had gone its own over time and space. But I'll actually show you how these four definitions play out in measurements uh, in this particular watershed. Well, in order to make this real or place it in the context of um, how these <coughs> definitions would actually result in commitments between the U.S. and Mexico and financial channels, I have to talk through how these countries relate to each other through some institutions that might actually have the wherewithal, the ability to start setting up wastewater pollution treatment plants um, uh, and or some other um, pollution control efforts. So let's walk through a really brief history of some of the institutions that really impact how the U.S. and Mexico relate to each other and then actually allude to, in a very real way, how the U.S., Canada, and Mexico relate to each other trilaterally. So for a long time, 1944 through 1994, uh, there was, there is a, still a recognized um, system of governance through the International Boundary and Water Commission, but they kept separate offices, one in the U.S., one in Mexico, and really their primary function was to talk, talk to each other occasionally over water allocations out of rivers like the Rio Grande for water use. They really didn't have discussions over water quality, <coughs> let's say pollution flowing between every country, each country. It was really just water quantity. And there still have been shared battles over whether in drought years, you know, some of the allocations that really should be going to Mexico really are finally getting there or not. So I would say that uh, in many cases, some of these are ongoing uh, discussions that require constant interaction between the countries. It's not that they solve them all in one day and Okay, that was up through uh, the mid-90s. Then, uh, formally, uh, in 1995, uh, trilaterally, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico signed a uh, trade agreement, this is the acronym for the North American Free Trade Agreement, and part of it was a signed agreement that formulated a couple of institutions on the southern border um, one called the Border Environmental Cooperation Commission, 
from FAT, because I'll refer to it here. And another one called the North American Development Bank. What, is, what does it mean? Well, this by formally signing the formation of these institutions, uh, there was some recognition that the institutions would, in fact, be the, um, the group that helps bring about projects that would solve shared pollution problems. So here's some long phrase to get at that point, that the, the Border Environmental Cooperation Commission would actually be certifying projects, and many, in many cases, they could receive projects that are submitted to them by really any public or private entity. It could be the, a city, let's say the city of Ciudad Juarez, or any entity that is interested in having um, the approval by this Board of Environmental Cooperation Commission to help in terms of implementing some form of, it's called environmental infrastructure, that phrase literally means pollution control projects, either in waterways, or in this case solid waste management, trash collection, uh, road construction to reduce um, emissions to air, and Another purpose that this uh, commission serves is actually providing some help for cities to actually prepare proposals for these projects to be planned out. Um, the North American Development Bank is actually a bank that helps finance these projects. So um, I wanted to quickly say, um, in a very structured way, these institutions that were set up in 1995 uh, are binational in nature. There's five members from each country in both cases, for the Environmental Cooperation Commission and the North American Development Bank. So they actually have one office uh, where they, the five members of each country in both cases, um, are discussing things and they're actually making decisions together to approve of these projects. Or in fact, in a very real way, uh, where they're actually discussing financing these projects, either through grants or loans. We'll get into a bit more description about uh, the financing as, as we move on, but I'll just briefly say, in 2000, there was actually this other channel of money coming into the binational institutions, and it was specifically from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, some grant monies. So what, is, what do grants mean? Well, you're all students, and hopefully you've received some grants, maybe to go to school here. What does that mean? Well, it's free money, right? That's a good thing. Uh, that's different from a loan, where you might have a bill at the end of your studies to pay back, right? What would you rather have, a grant or a loan? Okay, you're good at this. Uh, <laughs> and many of these cities along the border would also like grants rather than loans. In many cases, remember their financial abilities to pay back things uh, matter. Um, so the intent here was to at least get these projects going. And then, in many cases, we're actually going to explore this as we investigate some of the decision making, that the projects themselves, uh, in some cases, they were financed with grants or combination grants and loans, and then the nature of the projects often mean that they set up some user fees later for citizens to pay off these projects over the long term. Typically, I don't know if a lot of people know this, you know, the lifetime of, of a typical wastewater treatment plant. Well, it might be, you know, 50 years, something like that. So you build something up front, a lot of heavy duty, expensive costs, I'll show you some of the uh, dollar values on some of these projects. And uh, in many cases, you have to absorb all that money all at once just to get the thing going. Uh, you might have to stretch out those, you know, user fee paybacks over, you know, a good chunk of time. Um, so, just to remind myself and you of, of what's going on in this economic model again of the game, these countries involved in making these decisions, and in this case through these institutions. Uh, they're trying to minimize costs of pollution control, in this case, wastewater pollution control, and the damages that might be experienced, both upstream and down. Um, and what's often involved in my analyses that are quantitative is to do a very good job of modeling the pollution itself from upstream to down with 
a lot of information and help from some hydrologists and from some pollution paint and transport people. So I have to include that in the form of some of the data I'll talk through to do that. And then with all this framework, I'm going to compare cases of where US and Mexico actually then act together to minimize these costs and these damages uh, versus if they did it separately and then explore, you know, again, the financial arrangements under these four different definitions of what cooperation means, these different shares going on of the minimizing costs and then avoiding damages, and then investigate, you know, what does it really mean in terms of financial transfers that might be going on to get downstream and upstream to work together, things like that. So this is, in fact, an empirical study. Here's where I have to gather a lot of the numbers and the details for this. So I have to do a really good job of describing pollution flow. And so I talk to, and by the way, this uh, acronym here is for total suspended solids, a measure of wastewater pollution. And uh, some of the efforts really are focused on some studies that were done in the, the Tijuana watershed that arrives finally in this wetlands on the US side, and then also it's going in Mexico. So uh, part of what I have to do is, you know, quantify the cost of treating things upstream in Mexico before it crosses the border um, and the flow of things. And then if it arrives in the US, the cost of actually, and the, this terminology basically means that I'm doing some statistical estimation of the cost based on the flow and the accumulation of this wastewater. I just wanted to show you a picture of, it might not be a conventional treatment plan <coughs> that's often in the investment. What does this uh, phrase mean? It, it means what we want. And in fact, this is a picture of part of the Tijuana watershed in Mexico, and it's showing some actual variations in a thing, in that, as I was telling you, some of this is sprawled urbanization that's leading to erodibility and some things arriving on our side of the border uh, from, you know, probably poor, uh, poor planning or rapid urbanization. So in many cases, a lot of the water pollution control could actually be doing a better job of actually uh, urban management or shoring up some, as they call them, Mercarian space of the drainage areas. And so in many cases, and again, this is an economist trying to describe a uh, you know, biologist's effort. In many cases, it involves conservation biology, helping uh, restore some riparian habitat wetlands, and letting the wetlands actually do some filtration itself to retain some of the, uh, what could be eroded areas, and actually retain it in Mexico rather than it crossing the border and presenting a sedimentation pollution problem. Okay, and so, Basically, um, this is kind of a repeat of some of what was the institutional history. This is again a description of that membership of both the agencies. And again, this is a tally of specifically this watershed of what's been, um, uh, well, it's actually a tally of various expenditures going on across the border. But, um, if, it mentions some of the sources of grant funds between the two, uh, two agencies. And just to give you an idea that as of 2006, there was, you know, 877 million in grants spent, 1.2 billion in loans for writing important projects. And as of now, actually this month, last week, uh, both of these agencies held a meeting in Tijuana. And here's the tally. 82 projects in the U.S., 95 in Mexico. That's 177 projects. Remember back to one of the original slides, the projection back in the late 90s was 180 projects needed. Getting pretty close. Um, but uh, just to give you some idea of what their sort of prioritization has been, 86% uh, of those 177 projects are water and wastewater dominated, 40% are solid waste and earth. So my analysis of that data collection that I was doing is for this period of time when I was doing this study of this particular watershed. And just to give you an idea of some of the data I worked with, we're not going to march through this table. Um, this is 
what the Beck has on its ledger. Basically the names of various projects across the 1800 mile border, and oftentimes this fits into some of the sharing rules concepts. There's this estimation of the population to benefit from each of the projects. Um, there's a quantification of if there's been technical assistance in terms of monetary values spent by each of the um, border agencies for planning each type of project. The project's total costs and whether it's been financed by grants or by loans and the type of project it is, either WW wastewater, W for water, uh, solid waste, this W. Um, so had to you know, utilize data like that, uh, march down to CEDA Juarez uh, to, to meet with more environmental cooperation commission to, to get some of that data. And also, a very important part of the calculation is to do uh, some sort of estimation of damages and with the help of some, some people from UC Irvine, some epidemiologists, uh, Betty Olson, uh, one of them, uh, was in terms of actually, remember once, ag once again that picture of the watershed, the ultimate destination of a lot of the drainage from uh, the Tijuana River watershed is at Imperial Beach, coastal waters. So what we, were attempting to do was estimate, okay, supposing, you know, some form of damage is the water quality impacts right at that beach. If in fact it means that it's number of exposures and an illness rate, there's a technique bought, used by some economists to do a cost of illness. And it's considered a lower bound estimate just to give what might be one impact. Um, and in this case, it's some form that people were affected uh, simply by the water quality, uh, perhaps resulting in gastrointestinal illnesses. And again, the epidemiologists, including Betty Olson from UC Irvine, had some data, some information on these illness rates. So the cost of illness often involves some, uh, some estimates on lost wages and or medical costs uh, that go into dealing with being ill or in this case, um, exposure, swimming. Okay, that's a different form of damage, and you might say, gee, what's left out of this estimation altogether, or why it's considered a lower bound, is that we haven't even quantified any damages in the wetlands itself to receiving all this, um, you know, uncontrolled um, water pollution um, into the wetlands. This is a free wetlands, meaning even though it's designated as a national wetlands of significance, there's not an entry fee. You can just show up and look at, uh, you know, the migratory birds or drop around the wetlands. And so any effort to try and quantify that would be certainly over and above what damage we've captured here. On the Mexican side, there has been um, some gauge of uh, property damage from this Mexican Association of Insurance <coughs> Institutions, where there was some attempt to actually place some value on the lost, um, you know, those sort of makeshift structures on the hillsides that were eroded, some property lost there. Okay, we're not gonna read through this table, but I wanted to show you that, and, and kind of in a general organizational way, this is a, way in which to organize the comparison of uh, cooperative type outcomes versus non-cooperative outcomes. And the bottom line is in these different calculations that involve measuring the four different measure, measures of sharing rules, um, that cooperation results in lower um, quantities of the uh, stock of pollution, as well as more pollution being abated by both countries under cooperation than non-cooperation. To really get at the comparison, I'm actually going to show you a summary of what this table means in words, but I wanted to actually point out a couple things in this table. Um, these columns, these three columns, are actually attempting to work through the Helsinki rule. So remember again, that was the International Law Association's definition of how cooperate, countries that are cooperating to 
cooperating together with divine up gains. And they based it on physical measurements of population, land area, and hydrology. And all I wanted to demonstrate here is that if you take into account those physical measurements, let's say the population in the US is actually larger than Tijuana, then um, that would change the share of what it, each country would experience in cooperation versus if it's based on land area where Mexico's watershed, three quarters of it in Mexico, or the hydrology drainage would mean that share to Mexico is actually quite significantly greater. Um, shares change when you bring in the other definitions, the Shapley value, the Chandler Tolkien's value, and the equity value simply would mean a 50% split between the two. But what I've worked out here is the actual cost shares between both countries and then what the financial transfers might be from uh, downstream to upstream. But let me just summarize this finding from that big table of different things. Um, and by the way, uh, besides just kind of looking at the variations in cooperation versus uh, non-cooperation, I also wanted to do a sensitivity analysis where things might change over time, like costs or damages, where it might motivate the countries to act differently, too. So just wanted to mention that was in there. But let's sort of see what really resulted in this analysis. Well, it's better to cooperate, match the scale of management to the scale of the collision problem. So cooperation literally means it's a binational uh, strategy then where both countries are doing something for remaining efforts. And it's optimal in terms of they minimize the pollution costs together and the damages and the, and the stock of the ultimate wastewater pollution is actually lower. In all cases, under the four different uh, forms of cooperation, those different rules, there are some transfer payments <coughs> that are generated to induce upstream Mexico to control wastewater. And it's actually cheaper by transfer payments. What I mean is that it's actually cheaper for the US to spend money solving the problem upstream in Mexico than waiting for it to arrive downstream and experience the damages. And so the cooperative share is highest in Mexico with the physical measure of land area and hydrology. So they'd actually get 90% of the share of cooperation if those were the terms and their Helsinki rule. Um, of dividing up the gains for cooperation. In looking at the other sharing rules, the Shapley value, the Chandler Tolkien's rule, they still allocate positive transfers to Mexico based on sort of economic and sort of logic. Okay, at that time, from 1994 through 2006, the data I was looking at for that projection of things, uh, the level of funding more closely followed the population share physical measurement Helsinki rule of the way in which financing through the, the Board of Environmental Cooperation Commission and the, and the North American Development Bank were, were starting to finance things there, the wastewater treatment plants. Now, what I want to tell you is that as of a week ago, Tuesday, so February 9th, both <coughs> The Board of Environmental Cooperation Commission and the North American Development Bank met in Tijuana and they approved of two more wastewater treatment plants in Baja, California, right in Tijuana. And so, uh, sort of, you know, some sort of confirmation of um, my efforts here. And by the way, this publication came out probably three years ago, three or four years ago, uh, on this analysis that it's basically. Because in sort of a, you know investigating these four different sharing rules, it turns out that now, uh, as opposed to you know previously, if the data stopped at 2006, it would have been that the cooperation was following more of this physical measurement of population. But now, in a very updated way, through last week, um, it's more the case that it's kind of uh, straddling in terms of the amount of money, and again this prevalence of solving the problem upstream in Mexico, that the amount that's being shared or spent to the financial transfers is straddled between using the area hydrology measurements that they're thinking which again, this is kind of what's 
said here, this offered to share the science from Mexico. And it's uh, then also approaching the Shapley value. If we have this marginal contribution um, of gain to the overall uh, total cooperative setting. So that's actually considered a good thing. They actually fine tune their approach to solve this pollution problem over the long term. So that's a look at one watershed. I want to actually move us to, what are we doing on time? Is that right? How many? Okay, all right. This will be quicker. Um, I want to talk through the case where now it's actually an effort that I did to take a lot of decisions made by the Border Environmental Cooperation Commission over the entire 1800 mile border and look what they were doing in terms of the projects they were approving. So I'll just quickly run through this. Uh, it's a statistical analysis where I was looking at whether the Border Environmental Cooperation Commission approved or rejected projects and what were the different factors motivating their approving or rejecting. Remember, five members are from the U.S., five are from Mexico, and they make decisions together on spending, um, you know, approving of these projects for environmental improvement. So, bottom line, I'm going to show you, just walking through the results, um, and then convince you that I did this statistically with the next slide. But what are the what are the results? Basically, this agency, the financial agency favors projects that really do solve transboundary pollution problem, problems. So the proposals really have to, in, in fact, convince this agency that they're having an impact on both countries' uh, pollution problems, and that they actually have measurements up front of how we improve environmental and public health. Actually, that's some you know, variables for this in the analysis. The agency itself has favored, continues to favor water quality projects than those, rather than let's say solid. And in terms of some measure of um, what might be some various measures of uh, sustainability over time or something, uh, job opportunities seem to be a big thing. That they, you know, projects will be approved if they can actually show evidence that they're creating jobs in the process. They're actually more favored than projects that actually generate revenues on their own from reclaiming resources, let's say solid waste uh, recycling. Um, and it doesn't seem to be a goal of this agency to do an equitable split of financing. Remember the, the numbers count, the tally on how many projects are approved in Mexico versus the U.S. There's 95 in Mexico right now and uh, about 20 less in the U.S. So remembering back to this asymmetry going on, the upstream and the downstream, that should matter in terms of if you solve the pollution problem upstream, it may be the case that you actually, you know, have a project occurring upstream more often than just equitably split. And it's the case, in a very real way, for financing that even though this agency does approve of projects taking place in the upstream country along this long border, it may be the case that even though, you know, the project is situated in Mexico, it's not Mexico paying for this project. It's often with this you know, mixture of uh, loans, grants, but it's actually monies that are coming from elsewhere, uh, both both countries, that are actually financing this. And remember again, these, these cities often produce things that then go, you know, much further than their own consumption. So in many cases, these federal monies, you know, that finance these agencies that ultimately, uh, you know, dictate where these projects are situated, it may be the case that that's okay, that the money federally from the rest of the country is financing, uh, you know, places that are actually experiencing this pollution for things that we may consume in the rest of the country. Keep that in mind from just a kind of an accounting perspective. Here's just a general slide to show you that I actually did conduct a little analysis to do some of these results. I'm going to quickly allude to another transboundary pollution problem because it's a very real one, important one, that connects all three countries, and that's air pollution. And in a nutshell, I'm just going to tell you the largest source of air emissions on both international borders are in traffic delays entering and exiting these, these countries. I don't know if you've ever sat in a car at one of those borders, you know, border checkpoint, 
But in many cases, you're often perhaps behind, you know, a lot of other cars or whatever, and they're all piled up, and a lot of engines are running. And uh, again, an economist, not an air chemist, but I'll just briefly say that there is a correlation if you've got an idling engine, often a diesel truck, uh, idling, or they stop and start the uh, diesel engine, they're actually creating these horrible emissions. Uh, with, we'll get into some of the names of the pollutants uh, very quickly here. But in a very real way, my analysis here is focused on kind of a different uh, frame of reference. Whereas in the past, I was looking at cooperation through you know, institutions that are making decisions on setting up uh, treatment plants, let's say, right at the shared border. In this case, I'm actually going to examine some incentives where it's actually transportation participants, you know, car runners and uh, commercial truckers or something, to examine where some tri-national policies, when thought out properly, have worked or not to try and reduce air pollution at these two borders. So just making the initial connections of, you know, traffic delays at borders cause air emissions. These air emissions are kind of problematic for people who are actually breathing the air there. And so a really basic question that I'm I hopefully answered is uh, what policies have impacted transportation air and air pollution at the border? You know, have they worked or not? So very quickly, I'm going to um, talk through you know, what it meant to do this analysis, had to collect a lot of data, very data intensive project to get at really good forms of, uh, you know, time series data. I don't know if anybody in the room has run some statistics. I had to get at, you know, a length of years and different borders. So um, it's air quality measurements along those borders. Uh, transportation flow data. Uh, cars, trucks, and uh, you know, some way of controlling for emissions elsewhere, away from the border, like in the neighboring cities right here in the border, and then get at the aspects of when different policies went into effect or not at, along the different border ports of entry. So, the really basic setup of the data intensity of this project, here's the years that are involved, and they kind of cover some key ways in which these policies are actually quite uh, quite different in their intent and uh, what they were trying to what they were attempting to do. So basically panel set, what does that mean? Basically collecting a lot of data over time and space. And on the um, US Canada border, uh, I had data you know, for six different ports of entry and uh, eight different ports of entry on the U.S.-Mexico border. And so I had to get data for transportation flows of trucks, cars, uh, this is containers carrying different things, and buses. Air quality data from some air monitoring stations. Uh, I don't know if you've seen these acronyms for different pollutants. This is ozone, nitrous oxide, silver dioxide, and particulate matter. Pretty beautiful. Um, <laughs> Who's that? Put <laughs> um, some free flow data, too. And um, then what was actually one of the hardest types of data to get was from Customs and Border Patrol on border wait times, actually, the times in which engines wait at the border to pass through. This is, a, this is going to be a measure of congestion, and again, the correlation of if, in fact, these policies may work differently at lowering that wait time, speeding people through the border, there's less air emissions taking place. Kind of doing some hand waving to, to uh, explain some of the connections. Here are some of the policies I'm going to try and test out if they had any impact at helping reduce air emissions. One of them has a really long name, uh, Customs and Trade Partnership Against Terrorism. And an acronym that's used is FAST. Free and secure trade. What does that mean? Well, it's like a fast pass on the toll roads here. What does that mean? It's basically trucks are screened before they arrive at the border. They're screened to say, okay, they're safe to transport cargo. So trucks in this study are commercial, 
commercial vehicles that are actually bringing things between the countries. And they could be issued this you know, electronic device in their truck so they don't have to stop. And that might mean, in a very real way, they're not idling their engines or doing cold starts that lead to a lot of air emissions. So I'm going to test it out. This policy was actually implemented starting in 2003, but phased it. So it wasn't in all the ports at all the time. They phased it from 2003 and 2006. And as a person who does statistics, it's kind of relevant that things take place differently in a very different way. You're actually able to test out differences statistically uh, over time and space if it had an impact or not. Uh, another policy to test out in a small sample set is fuel policy. A low sulfur uh, fuel was available only on the US Canada border in two ports. So it's actually going to be kind of less of a really dramatic effect here, but I'll say perhaps in the future that might be more widespread. Diesel technology. In a very real way, in 2004, diesel engines were changed in trucks. I'm going to see if that has quite an effect. I actually add some other um, policies just to see if the scale of uh, activity going on transportation lines might have changed. And in this case, it, um, road infrastructure might have made a difference. Let me quickly summarize this again, a statistical page. I'm going to show you, just to wrap up here, this is kind of a tally of the pollutants that were actually reduced by different policies and the amount of ports that you saw a noticeable effect uh, at each border. So again, this is the acronym for the, I call it the trade policy, where trucks and commercial trucks were given a pass to be screened ahead of time and not have to wait at the border. So it speeded the flow of trade and products, let's say, and reduced air emissions. And again, acronyms for air pollutants, uh, carbon monoxide, ozone, particulate matter, and nitrogen oxides in six ports at the U.S.-Canada border and in eight ports in the U.S.-Mexico border. Another significant policy was changing diesel engines, 2004, uh, for uh, NOx and particulate matter in six ports on the U.S. Canada border because all the trucks, in in some sense, are of the same vintage <coughs> as the U.S. and Canada, and it you could say we're going to longer discussions here where uh, trucks vary quite dramatically on the U.S. Mexico border, but it did have some impact on particulate matter in two ports. Uh, I'm just going to draw some conclusions because I know I'm reaching that end point. Um, but in a very real way, this study, attempting to just use any available data where I could across both borders, really says some dramatic things. Very significantly, it is key to control for the cities that are right next to the ports of entry. Again, in a very real way, remember that first map of the entire continent, you have to control for wind patterns that might actually be delivering you know, some of the pollutants out of the neighboring city to the border itself, the border port of entry. So you have to, in a statistical way, recognize that to be able to distill, you know, whether it's the cities influencing things versus policies that people between the three countries are actually trying to implement. So really had to account for that and match it with the air currents that are going on. So in some ways, the north to south air currents were actually, you know, validated here as having an influence. But once those are controlled for, you can still see that the clean diesel policy makes a difference. If you're trying to you know, have some impact on trucks uh, by getting them to change their engine, it really does help reduce some pretty, you know, in a pretty big way, some, some uh, pollutants that are, can be pretty noxious at various uh, ports. And road infrastructure projects did reduce uh, small amount of ports uh, for a couple of people in carbon dioxide and particulate matter. Um, the FAST policy really was significant across um, all pollutants that were in our um, database to measure, and it's across all the ports in the sample, so that was pretty significant. And in a very real way, this policy works in conjunction with reducing the wait times that trucks might actually be generating a lot of air pollution. I wanted to bring this up too because private vehicles, you know, cars pass through borders. Some ports of entry actually only have cars. The commercial trucks are actually stuck off to another 
uh, port of entry. And so that was important to examine too, what motivates private cars or reductions. And so oftentimes labor forces are given these passes too, if they actually are uh, constant travelers across the border, maybe they're part of the labor force that crosses. And so there was a noticeable change uh, at different ports on the US uh, Mexico border for some pollutants, and then uh, these two ports of entry are on the US Canada border. Okay, and there, there is this recognition that some of these um, policies haven't been phased in at the same time, so Mexico really does have to go further in actually getting a lot of their trucks to uh, modify their engines uh, too, so it's supposed to be phased in uh, by um, uh, next year. What are the overall conclusions of these efforts? And I've sort of quickly been showing you sort of a variety of scales, uh, hopefully keeping you somewhat interested in, um, you know, some topics that I haven't delved into. But what's the overall message here? Either through, um, you know, the wastewater efforts where you have institutions making decisions, um, it's really cooperation, you know, where the management is matching the actual pollution problem that really has made a difference. You know, the money has been spent so to solve these pollution problems that they jointly share. And maybe things got bad enough that it really did make them care. You know, my estimates, my attempt to estimate the damages as well as the costs that they face, uh, you know, at least were kind of a good representation of what these agencies that have jointly been formulated do in terms of their coordination efforts. Um, also, in shifting gears to the air pollution setting, it can also be, if it's not institutions that are actually uh, financing you know, for, uh, wastewater treatment plants right on the border, that it's actually, on a tri-national level, jointly agreeing to policies that affect, in this case, mobile forms of pollution between each other, you know, the transportation that's actually connecting them um, through the ports of entry on the border. Uh, these trinational policies that they've coordinated really can make a difference, in this case, to affect transportation flows uh, and the way in which they can reduce air pollution. Um, also, I guess I would like to be able to conclude that this effort, these analyses that really have been, you know, quite a team effort, let's say, where I actually do have to go out and collect information and, and model it properly with the help of some people who actually know the definitions of pollution or interacting with some of the agencies who uh, actually have some uh, relevant management uh, efforts to model properly here, um, can actually help inform and, uh, you know, make policymakers, you know, ponder ways in which they could solve these problems over the long term for these, you know, big, big areas that they're actually trying to manage.